The crash test dummies, Frank and Larry said you could learn a lot from a dummy. That has application to quail management as well and in a process that we call dummy nest. We're gonna be putting out chicken eggs, three chicken eggs to simulate the nest of a bob white quail and then we're gonna monitor that at two weeks and four weeks to give an estimate of how many of those nests survive. This is really a very telling exercise and I encourage any student of quail to incorporate these. We're here with one of our summer interns, Christine. Christine's from North Carolina. She's gonna set up a dummy nest transect. We're gonna follow her along. The supplies are pretty basic. They're not expensive, easily done. You, all you need are chicken eggs. Now don't touch those chicken eggs with your bare hand. You wanna have some latex gloves because those eggs have never been touched by human hands and we don't wanna put our scent on them that would make them more vulnerable to predation. You gotta think about your predators. You wanna to try to minimize their attempts to find this. And you need some flagging tape, some steel washers. We'll show you why those are necessary in a minute. And then a data sheet to record your information on. Step number one is that we need to mark our transect, our starting point. So I'm just gonna tie some flagging tape on here on this mesquite limb. And that way we know that uh, this particular transect is, just says transect start. Now we're gonna walk off and every 50 steps, we're gonna place a dummy nest. So come with us. 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Okay, at the 50th step, then we tie a flag on here representing nest number one. Transect one, nest one, that's our marker. Now, I don't want to get too luxuriant with my tape here. I want about a eight inches or so of tape. I don't want enough flagging tape out there that every critter in the world could say, hey, last time I found that tape, I found a nest. We want to be kind of discreet about our flagging. Again, we don't want to send a telegraph to our enemies. So I'm going to tie that over here on this mesquite limb. Okay, 10 steps. Now here's the decision point. Now you look around and you say, what is the nearest suitable bunch of grass that I think a quail would actually nest in? Now remember, a bunch of grass ought to be about the size of a basketball. So now we're gonna shop around here just a minute until we find what we think is a great candidate. Christine has found a good candidate. Good, nice clump of silver blue skin. I'm gonna take the toe of my boot, kind of wallow it out a little bit. Now then, we'll take a look at that. And that gives an idea of what a quail nest actually looks like. But the first thing she does is put a steel washer in there. And you might think, well, a quail doesn't have a steel washer in its nest. That's really important to you. All this country's gonna look like in two weeks. Don't think, oh, I can remember where I put that. You can't. Mark it with a steel washer. Now she's gonna put three chicken eggs in there to simulate a quail's nest. A quail actually has about 12 to 14 eggs in it, but they'll be about the same size the nest will as what we're simulating here. Once she places the eggs in there, she kind of dresses the nest back up pulls the grass back over it again. She wants to make that look just like an actual quail's nest. If you don't do a good job of quality control, your data will reflect that. So you've got to keep in mind, you're trying to simulate what's really going on in a quail's world. If you're not a good quail mama, we're going to find out. Once she has the nest situated, now she walks back directly to the flag that we tied in the tree. She's counting the number of steps and we're gonna write this down on our data sheet where we can find that nest in two weeks. What's the answer here, Christine? 23 steps. 23 steps, east, northeast, in what? Uh, silver blue. Silver blue stem. Now you cannot get too detailed on those notes. On the east corner. Please. On the east corner? Okay. You've gotta have very detailed notes so that'll allow you in two weeks to walk right back to that nest check on it, see if it is intact or if it's been depredated, if something got into it. If it's intact, we just mark a zero down, indicating that it's in good shape. We replace those eggs at two weeks. Why? Two weeks in this heat, you can appreciate those eggs are gonna begin to rot. Rotting provides an olfactory cue for your enemies. We don't want that. So we will provide fresh eggs for any nest that is still intact at two weeks. We replace those eggs with new eggs. 45. 48, 49, 50. Okay, now this is transect one, nest number two, and we're gonna situate this one in prickly pear. We like to put a half our nest in grass. We put the odd number nest in grass. 
and they even numbered nest and prickly pear. That allows us to compare the results between grass nest and prickly pear nest. All right, Christine, march off 10 steps, find us a prickly pear. Okay, we found a good clump of prickly pear, so we're gonna repeat the process. You take the toe of the boot, kind of wallow out an area in there. We're gonna put our steel washer in there. The three chicken eggs. We're gonna be careful where we kneel and how we handle this. Well, obviously that prickly pear will get you. The nests that are located in prickly pear survive at about twice the rate of those that are situated in grass. It's not rocket science. That prickly pear does provide some mechanical protection against some of your enemies. What we've discovered is once you get about 300 grass clumps per acre, we're gonna show you how to estimate that in a second, once you get to that threshold, the nests that are situated in grass tend to survive at just about the same rate as those that nest in prickly pear. Obviously, if you're a quail hunter, you'd rather be able to hunt in grass more so than prickly pear for your dog's sake. So that's, those are all important relationships. We'll show you how to estimate those here in a minute. 15 steps west in prickly pear near cat claw. Near cat claw. Okay, again, that level of detail is important to you, so you'll be able to find that nest two weeks from now. We check those nests again at two weeks, replace any eggs that are intact with fresh eggs, and then at four weeks. So we have two checks on these, and then at the end of that 28-day trial, what percentage of those nests are surviving? That's the statistic that we're after. What we hope to see is at least 50% of our nests surviving at 28 days. We've had some really good results, some of in excess of 80% out here. That tells us we've got some really good nesting cover. Once we get above 50% success, we don't think we have much of a predator problem. Again, that's because of good nesting habitat. Okay, now we estimate how many potential bunch grasses and prickly pear nest sites we have per acre. We do that with a belt transect. I'm walking back along our flagged route, and every time I encounter a bunch grass of basketball size, I call out grass, grass. And Christine writes that down on the data sheet. When I come across a prickly pear of sufficient size, I say pear, grass, grass, grass grass, and at the end of my transect now, I can determine how much area I actually sampled if those grasses or pear were, were rooted within my arm span. I know how wide that transect is, I know how long it is, I know how many clumps that I counted, so I can estimate bunch grass density and prickly pear density. Again, we'd like to have at least 300 suitable nest sites per acre for quality nesting habitat. As we're checking our dummy nest, then we shift to CSI mode. Who done it? Once we find eggshell evidence at a particular nest, we try to make an educated guess about was this caused by a skunk, raccoon, whatever the case may be. Quickly, I'm gonna show you some of the eggshell evidence that we think are clues. Now, these are not definite. These are educated guesses, but they are uh, something for you to think about as you're checking those nests. If this was the nest bowl, and I see large eggshell fragments, but they're all within 18 inches or so of the nest bowl, from our experience, that tells me that's a raccoon. Aha, well, that's a common culprit. I'm gonna go so far as to say that's a boar raccoon, that's a male. He was operating independently. I'll show you why in a minute. See this kind of evidence, large eggshell fragments, close to the nest, you think raccoon, male raccoon. All right, let's move right down here. Got another set of data here, another set of observations, okay. Here's our nest bowl, now, Contrasted to the last one, these are very neat. Look how clean and neat that's eaten off of the large end of the egg. The eggshell fragments are largely intact. They're right in the nest bowl. Who done it? This is uh, evidence of a skunk. Unlike a raccoon, a skunk doesn't have opposable thumbs and a large enough mouth that they can pick up that egg and move it. So they're gonna eat the eggs pretty close to the nest bowl. So large eggshell fragments close to the nest bowl and typically very neat, that's indicative of a skunk. Let's move down to the next one. Oh, what do we got here? Well, here's the nest bowl. And we've got one set of eggshell remains right here, and then we have to look around, where did the rest of them go? Oh, well, wait a minute, here's another set of eggshell fragments over here, and lo and behold, here's another one up here. So the evidence at the crime scene says large egg eggshell fragments, but they're not in one location. This is a tip. This is evidence that it was 
that this nest was depredated by a family of raccoons. And here's my reenactment of it. Junior comes up, he finds the, the nest, he gets one. Mama sees him, she comes up and slaps him, takes that one away, so he doesn't stand there and eat that one. He takes his and carries it over here. And his little sister picks up one and carries it over here. So that kind of evidence indicative of a family of raccoons. Another possible situation, a possum. A possum will pick up one, carry it off, eat it. He'll come back, he'll get another egg, pick it up, carry it off and eat it. So possum or a family of raccoons. Okay, here's a scene that uh, we see fairly commonly here at the research ranch. Very small eggshell fragments. They've just been basically pulverized right at the nest bowl. That's a coyote. That's classical evidence of a coyote. That coyote just picks that egg up, puts it in his mouth. He's just chomping it like that, and the whole time those eggshell fragments are dropping on the ground. So that's pretty common, coyote. Let's go to the next one. Oh, another classical situation here. Eggs are in the nest bowl. The eggs have been bitten across the long axis of the of the egg, they've been bitten across like this, but the eggs are in the nest bowl. Pretty definitive for a bobcat. Now we don't think bobcats are major egg predators, but each year we monitor nests, we do get some bobcats. This is their classical type of evidence that they leave. All right, let's move to the next one. Similar to a bobcat in that the eggs are in the nest bowl, but it has holes in the eggs. And a lot of times you'll find a fair amount of yolk still in the eggs. These are typically re a result of a bird. That's the bird's beak basically pecking a hole in that. Now we've got some pretty strange culprits. Uh, you know, you'd think when you say bird, you'd say, oh, roadrunner. Uh, roadrunners have never been photographed eating eggs out here. We photograph them at the nest, they move on. We do uh, see things like crows, like ravens, and oddly enough, wild turkeys. So we have had some that have been broken by birds. Typically you're looking for that beak in the eggshell. About uh, two more, I think. Oh, what's happened here? Well, here's the nest bowl. How do we know that? Because we were smart enough to put that washer in there. So that tells us we found the nest bowl, but there's no eggshell evidence present. Let me ask you, who done it? Hmm. I know what you're thinking, snake, right? Snake would come in there and eat those eggs. That's a possible candidate. That's the one that makes the most sense. We've never photographed a snake taking eggs. Now we know what happens, but we never get any pictures of it. What we've learned is that basically any predator we've talked about is capable of leaving absolutely no eggshell evidence out here. So you gotta keep that in mind. It's not a perfect science, it's an educated guess. Even wild hogs, which you would think would have a lot of rooting. And if you ever see rooting sign around a nest, well you'd say, well that was done by a wild hog. But wild hogs, we know through video surveillance, they're capable of being very dainty eaters. So again, this is a very useful exercise. It's fun. It allows you to be CSI, be Quincy, be that detective, and you'll learn a lot by monitoring these dummy nests. Now you might wonder, how in the world did we figure all this out? Well, we had intelligence, intelligence provided by game cameras, another useful tool. Fidel Hernandez did this for his master's thesis where he described the modus operandi of various nest predators based on eggshell evidence. He had set some eggs out. We used both chicken eggs and quail eggs in a separate experiment. We found eggshell evidence of the quail eggs only 3% of the time. We found eggshell evidence of the chicken eggs 90% of the time. So they're a much more useful tool for this CSI kind of work than the quail eggs. Match those dummy nests with some game camera technology and you have the opportunity to decipher some of those mysteries that are occurring on the rangeland. It's a very telling experiment and I recommend it to any students of quail. Indeed, you can learn a lot from a dummy.